converter locks up a little, slows it back down. You can see those since the 60s. They're a triumph of mechanical ingenuity and a visual feast on wheels. From high boy roadsters to hopping lowriders to tricked out import tuners. Custom cars are as various as the people who craft them and as singular as a fingerprint. Cars are what we all have in common, but hot rodders and customizers embrace them in a way that nobody else does. They use their cars not only as transportation, but as a means of creating something almost from scratch that they could call their own. The classic customs and hot rods from decades past are cherished by collectors and showcased in galleries and museums. The Knee Camp Roadster was the first America's Most Beautiful Roadster winner, 1950, Oakland Roadster Show. If we ever put that car for sale, um, I think it would bring four or $500,000. But for most customizers, the point isn't to create a museum piece or even a prize for best in show. It's to move on down the road to see and be seen. One of the commonalities between hot rods, low riders, tuners, is that they can be built piece by piece by piece by piece. These cars are like oysters, you know, one layer after another. The car represents an art form. The only difference between us and people that put it on paper is we do our art and then we drive it around. That's what we do. Whatever its vintage, restructuring an automobile to enhance its style is hard physical work. Customizer Gene Winfield's masterful metalwork and exquisite paint schemes have made him a legend in the field. At his shop in the Mojave Desert, he incorporates original designs from molded grills to louvered hoods to ensure that each car he customizes is unique. Each and every car, I look at it, maybe I study it for a little while, and then I, I try to figure out things that I can do that'll be a little different. With custom cars, we try to put different grills, different tail lights, and things so that each and every car has at least some things that are totally different than the other guy. Winfield lowers the roof of a 1949 Mercury the way he's done it for the last 50 years. Drop an inch here. With hand tools, elbow grease, and a hard-earned degree in backyard technology, it's called chopping the top. What we're aiming for here, of course, is a typical chopped mercury, which is, uh, you know, all mercury should be chopped, in my opinion. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And we're going to chop it approximately uh, four inches in front and five in the rear. Winfield begins by installing temporary braces inside the car to keep the body stable. Then he measures the windshield and calculates how much he'll remove from the supporting pillars to achieve the desired slant. This is called the A pillar, this is the B pillar, and this is the C pillar. So on this particular chop, I'm going to cut it out completely, I'm going to re-angle it, and then we're going to have what we call a slanted post. While tracing his cuts along the belt line, Winfield marks a section for removal at the C pillar, so the top will have room to settle when it's lowered. Okay, so now we're going to start cutting. Okay. After cutting the pillars, Winfield marks more cuts to flatten the curve of the roof. See, that's the big problem in the Mercury's. They have a kind of a big dome in the roof right here. And we have to stretch that forward and get rid of that. And that allows the top to go forward and down to a new angle. Okay. It forward. Finally, it's time to check out the chop. Okay. The initial chop looks good, but Winfield will fine-tune its shape to achieve the ideal proportion. Have a little bit, uh... That's the most important thing on a Mercury is to get that flow. 
And that's just super important to get that right. That's the way we do it to get a classic chopped mercury. Custom work by Winfield and countless others is displayed at shows throughout the country. If you notice how the steering is, we're going to the box right here. There, drivers swap parts and stories and admire the details of each other's craft. This is slick. Oh, it's total Americana. You're making a statement about who you are, what you do, what you enjoy, and you're letting everybody else see it and letting everybody else appreciate it. For all their differences, car customizers have long shared a do-it-yourself spirit and a distinctly populist ethic. For generations, they've been disregarding Detroit's top-of-the-line models in favor of everyday people's cars. From Model A's to modern imports. And then doing whatever it takes to restyle them into the rods and customs of their dreams. As far as the culture and and the lifestyle are different. The cars are very much different. But the common factor is the passion. Ever since cars began to roll off assembly lines, customizers have tried to make them look better and run faster. But the root of today's custom cultures can be traced to the 1930s and a racing scene that took shape on the dry lakes of Southern California. The dry lakes were just like, you know, a, a cemented lake. I mean, is it perfectly flat? It's so smooth and it's so hard and you can just drive as fast as you want for as long as you want. And that's what these guys did. By the mid-30s, the car of choice was a Ford Roadster. The 32 Roadster was the first that came equipped with an inexpensive eight-cylinder engine known as the Ford Flathead. The car's distinctive grille, molded into the body, was undeniably stylish. More practically, like other roadsters, its cloth top and windshields were easily removed. My father's 32 Roadster, that was the family car. Uh, they only had one car. I mean, it went to get the groceries, it went to take my dad to work and back, and, uh, and then my mother used it when he wasn't using it. And then come the weekend, that they were going to go to the dry lakes, you know, the fenders came off, the running board came off, headlights. The Roadster was the cheapest model in the line. It was the lightest model in the line because it didn't have a roof, it didn't have uh, with side windows, and it was kind of sporty. With little history to guide them, the dry lakes racers customized their cars by trial and error. Bigger tires in the rear changed the gear ratio for a better top speed while smaller ones up front decreased wind resistance. The front end could be lowered by heating and dropping the front axle. The result? A gently sloping angle, or rake, of three to four degrees, which came to define the classic hot rod look for decades to come. When you race on the dry lakes, you can either make horsepower or you can streamline it. They both have the same effect. They both make the car go faster, and they did both. Many of the Dry Lakes racers were mechanical mavericks. In the late 1930s, Vic Edelbrock Sr. designed and machined a manifold to increase air fuel intake. He called it the slingshot because of its Y-shaped design. Ed Iskandarian ground camshafts that increased engine performance at high RPMs. It's guys that are smart enough to figure out how to make the stuff they need when they don't have it. You didn't go buy your parts, you just took the existing parts and made them better, or made a manifold like my dad did. He had a knack of looking at something in an engine, an internal combustion engine, and figuring out what was wrong, what it needed, and to go from there. The Dry Lake scene came to a temporary halt with the onset of World War II. But many of the racers found work and developed new ideas in the wartime aeronautics industry. They came back from the war, they knew how to machine parts, they knew what a combustion engine was like, they knew how superchargers worked, they had some rudimentary idea about aerodynamics, witnessed the, the belly tank racers. After the war, Dry Lakes racer Bill Burke built a race car using an aluminum fuel tank from a fighter plane. He built a model for Alex Exidius, founder of the SoCal Speed Shop who sat it on a pair of Ford Model A and B axles. Racing in Utah at Bonneville in 1952, Exidius's belly tank racer set five speed records, 
and eventually exceeded 200 miles per hour. This is the car that put the SoCal Speed Shop and SoCal California on the map. This is Alex's original belly tank from uh, which he began racing in 1948 through 1952. Set a ton of records in this car with no roll cage, no safety belt, nothing. A lot of young guys came back and they'd been flying P-51s and you know doing fighter jockeys and they were suddenly dumped back into slow motion and. I think the need for speed was even greater in, you know, in the post-war era. And that's when it really took off. As Dry Lake Racing grew more popular, its innovators began to set up shop throughout Southern California, laying the basis for a growing industry in aftermarket parts. As word spread, their products were snapped up by a very different group of car customizers. Southern Moonshiners. So they started mail ordering camshafts and intake manifolds for their V8 flathead Fords to put into their 40 Ford tankers or moonshine cars. When Junior Johnson would make his nightly run, and he was running White Lightning, he had an old pickup truck, looked old on the outside, but was all new on the inside, and it had an Edelbrock equipped Ford flathead in it that absolutely ran away from the feds. Unlike the Dry Lakes racers, bootleggers needed to keep their cars looking stock on the outside, so as not to attract lawful attention. 1940 Ford Business Coupes were popular cars of choice. Along with engine modifications, back panels were removed to make room for contraband. Leaf spring suspensions were fortified by adding steel leaves. Wider wheels and tires help drivers navigate hairpin turns on bumpy back roads. Some drivers installed large stainless steel containers in the trunk, which were fitted with a valve that could release its contents in the midst of a chase. After their Saturday night runs, the drivers often got together to race on Sundays, competing for a few extra dollars on a burgeoning circuit that would come to be known as NASCAR. That's how NASCAR started, and that's what NASCAR is today. It was the moonshiners running, running against each other with, the, with their stock-looking cars that really weren't stock underneath. Car customizers had made their mark on dry lakes and racetracks. But a younger generation would soon put the hot in hot rod by taking it to the streets. At a raceway near Bakersfield, California, Long rows of meticulously restored roadsters and customs strut their stuff at the annual Hot Rod Reunion. It's a scene that harkens back to an era when hot rods were an emblem of California teen culture. Like surfboards and rock and roll, viewed with suspicion by parents and with envy by peers. Those were simpler times, less complicated, less nuanced. You know, so you had a big snarling V8, you know, pretty much the world was your oyster. Hot Rodding's golden age began shortly after World War II. Production of new cars had been suspended during the war, and once it resumed, older models became cheap and plentiful. A younger generation of Hot Rodders gradually developed a look that reflected the need for speed. Hoods and fenders were stripped off, even for street driving, while a chopped windshield and baloney sliced air stacks above the carburetors all but screamed power. Right here, we have a, basically the essence of a hot rod. It's a 32 Ford Roadster, original 32 frame, 32 Roadster body, steel body. No amenities, no air conditioning, no power steering, no power brakes, just pure power. In a lightweight body, stripped of anything non-necessary to make it go fast. Hollywood's hot rod image of reckless abandon wasn't entirely contrived. Unlike the Dry Lakes racers, Southern California's hot rodders did their racing on the street, with often disastrous results. There was a lot of stigma against hot rodders. Because of the street racing and the unsafe nature of the cars, they were just 
put together basically a body on a chassis, the lighter the better with a big motor, not necessarily good on brakes, not necessarily, a lot of them good on suspension or turning, and um, they go out and race and, and crash and people would die. To help corral the problem, Hot Rod Magazine editor Wally Parks formed the National Hot Rod Association in 1951 to move races off the streets and into sanctioned areas. The beginning of modern day drag racing. There were so many drag strips you could just go out and partake on a Wednesday night or a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, wide open. Then got almost everybody off the street as far as street racing was going on. While hot rods aimed for speed, classic customs celebrated style. These were full-bodied cars, whose outlines were molded and streamlined to create a more aesthetically pleasing look. Early customizers painted their cars in dark, subtle hues. They removed door handles and emblems and stripped away excess chrome. Fenders were extended to create long, graceful lines, while headlights were Frenched by molding them inward. Replacing stock parts with higher-end grills, bumpers, and wheel covers bequeathed an exotic, uncertain identity to otherwise familiar Fords and Mercuries. They could take a Cadillac grill and put it in this Ford. They could take the Cadillac wheel covers, take the big white wall tires that were on the fancy cars, put the Buick skirts over the back, and all of a sudden, what is this car? More radical alterations included channeling, in which the floor was removed so the body could be lowered over the frame. Then the floor was reattached. Channeling left less room inside the car, but brought the body closer to the ground. They had to be low, they had to be raked just right, you know, they had to look like great big bars of soap sliding down the street. Magazines showcased the work of top California customizers, like Sam and George Barris. I was able to photograph as we were building cars, and I would put how to, these are done, in the magazines. So the guy back in Kokomo, Indiana, said, oh, I can now chop a top because I've seen the way Barris did it. But every mark we, we chopped was different. We never made one or two exact. A 1951 Mercury customized by the Barris brothers for its owner, Bob Hirohata, was driven from Los Angeles to Indianapolis to compete in a major car show. When it took the top prize, a star was born. He came up with this, what at the time was a totally revolutionary color, which was to go away from these deep dark colors to this bright pastel uh, seafoam green or ice green, whatever you want to call it. Restored to its original state by its owner of 40 years, Jim McNeil, the Hirohata Merc may be the most famous custom ever made. For many, its flowing lines and exquisite detail mark the apex of the lean, clean custom style. The grill in this car is made of three 1951 Ford grills. This, this would be the center section. It used to have bullets here. They took the bullets out moved these pieces in and then they took another section like this and made one here and another section from this end and, and put it over here together same on this side and then handmade these uh, plastic uh, parking lights so it was one of the first cars that actually took up the whole front with a nice wide floating type of grill there used to be a dip here that they removed and brought this line straight back to this point and then they actually split the fender here and brought this side out where a piece of metal was welded in here all the way back. These are 52 Chevy teeth right here uh, out of a grill and then they made the skirts that are flush mounted with the uh, with the fender and these are 52 Lincoln taillights and they, they made a nice little roll around there and, and you know smoothed it all in around there and cut the bumper so this fit and then they ran the exhaust tips right out through the bumper which was really a, a really custom touch you know the pipes hung down and and you would scrape them anyway uh so they that was 
you know, and that, and that was something that really caught on. Inside the car, green and white tuck and roll pleats are augmented by handcrafted dash knobs and pinstripes by the celebrated custom artist, Von Dutch. But how do you get into this car? Pressing a hidden button along the chrome strip activates a solenoid, a kind of triggering device inside the door panel. The solenoid's plunger pulls the latch. The trunk opens the same way. And you can see when you push the button, this magnet pulls in and it pulls this trunk latch open and that's what opens the trunk. They drive into a drive-in and they get out, close the door, and you know, the Joe family man would look over and go, how are you going to get back in that thing? The Hirohata Merck's vibrant two-tone paint also signaled a transition to an era of more visually striking candy colors. These were bright toners applied over a base of gold or silver paint, then covered with up to 40 coats of clear lacquer and hand rubbed to a blinding sheen. Gene Winfield developed a technique of blending candies with pearls. Early pearls were finely ground seashells mixed with lacquer and sprayed over the toner to create a subtle gleam. I would paint a car white and put the gold pearl over the white and in the sun, in the highlighted areas, it would, the gold would just jump out at you. But then on the downside, uh, where you'd look down across the, or the shadowed side, it had a very slight blue cast. As the 50s progressed, customs grew even more ornate. Candies and pearls gave way to panel paint, scallops, and flames. Imaginative custom designs like Ed Big Daddy Roth's cartoonish fiberglass bodies, Daryl Starbird's futuristic bubble tops, and George Barris's Batmobile, featured in the popular 60s TV show, turned their creators into icons. For a glorious decade, customs and hot rods flourished as antidotes to Detroit's relatively stodgy style. But by the late 50s, major manufacturers were aping the streamlined customs look. Styling verges on the spectacular. From air scooped grills to the dramatically sweeping tail fins that dominate most of the 57 models. The cars are longer and lower than ever this year, too. A few years later, Detroit began producing lines of muscle cars and pony cars that combined sporty looks with hot rod horsepower. Mainstream imitations were flattering, but for hot rodders and customizers, their effects were devastating. Now a customer can walk into the dealership and buy a muscle car for maybe four or $5,000, and, and instead of spending the same money on a car that he already paid three or 4000 for. So Detroit really just totally ruined the custom business. Hot rods and customs pretty much disappeared from the streets. And they stayed gone for a couple of decades. But even as classic customs faded from view, an emerging car culture would ride lower and slower than ever. of Los Angeles on a Sunday afternoon, a cavalcade of shimmering, metal-flaked, pinstriped cruisers practice a unique style of hop and roll. For these custom cars, it's all part of a weekend ritual that's been going on for decades, the dance of the lowriders. Lowriding, to me, is a flashy car. <laughs> but it's more than that, I would say. Um, Lowriding's a lifestyle. I mean, just having a vehicle to portray my own individuality. Low riding came into its own during the 1960s, even as other forms of customizing were going out of style. Its roots can be traced to the 1940s, when fashion-minded zoot suitors gave their cars a stylized look by pushing them close to the ground, sometimes by piling sandbags in the trunk. But as low riding developed in Southern California's black and Latino communities, it also became part of a larger social movement. 
there was this cultural renaissance in black and brown neighborhoods, you know, in the 40s and 50s and 60s, where it was music, it was cars. It was about creating, I think, a very Los Angeles youth cultural identity. Like customs, the lowrider look evolved from muted colors, often gray or black primer paint, to more brilliant candies, pearls, and metal flakes. Early metal flake paints consisted of tiny aluminum squares, or shaved chrome, which were mixed with clear lacquer, sprayed over the base, and then covered with more lacquer to overlie the metal tips before sanding and buffing. We'll just spray it on there and that thing will twinkle. Uh, it, it was just awesome. And you can see that deepness, that, that rich, where you can, if it's a candy apple red paint job, you just want to bite it. Though metal flake remains popular among lowriders, contemporary cars also sport a combination of abstract pinstriping and lines of gold leaf. Interiors have evolved from velvet and velour to leather, with ostrich and even alligator trim. Yeah, no, we spare no expense on the ostrich. We used ostrich on the visor. We used ostrich on the piping. Most people would have just ditched it. But we said, no, we got to follow the scheme all the way around with ostrich all the way through. And that's it. We just try to make it plain and simple, make it look good. Hand-painted murals display mythic imagery, religious icons, and celebrations of the female form. Art became part of a way to inspire the community to take pride in their culture, um, to celebrate their culture, um, and to use art as a way to tell a story. And I think unlike murals that are on walls, I think that the murals on cars allow you to take it out of the, the boundaries of the radio. Of course, the primary aim of a low rider is to ride low, very low. Early techniques included installing smaller tires, which brought the frame closer to the ground. Coil suspensions were torched, with several coils removed to shorten their reach. For leaf spring suspensions, leaves were rearranged to flatten the curve, then topped with lowering blocks to pull the chassis closer to the wheels, making the car lower still. A magnesium plate attached to the undercarriage provided the payoff, creating colorful sparks when a lowrider literally hit the highway. But riding low also sparked trouble with the law. To try and clear the streets of these vehicles, a 1959 California statute prohibited any part of a car from dipping below the bottom of the wheel rim. Lowriders responded by developing battery-powered hydraulic systems, which could raise or drop a suspension while a car was in motion, navigating it over rough roads and past police inspections. The evolution of the hopping kind of came from adding the batteries, the vehicle eventually coming up off the ground because it was coming up so fast. One guy just got the idea, hey, let me see what I can do and let's make this thing bounce. Homie's Hydraulics, east of Los Angeles, a customized suspension system begins with the installation of metal frames, which are welded directly to the chassis from inside the trunk. Coil springs are trimmed to lower their height, then fitted to hydraulic cylinders or strokes. Here we have a, we have your actual stroke. This is a 10-inch stroke. We got, you got your donut right here, and we got a cup. This cup actually sits inside the, stro the actual coil right here. And this little piece gets welded onto the trailing arm so it doesn't slip around and everything's locked into place like that. It's gonna come up in here. And sit in there just like that. And then when, when that oil gets pumped into the hose, there's a shaft in here, it's gonna extend and this is going to hit all the way to the top of the frame, compressing the coil, making the car go up. The cylinders are connected by hoses to motorized hydraulic pumps, similar to those used in the gate lifts of delivery trucks, and filled with 30-weight motor oil. The pumps can both propel and retract fluid from the cylinders by flipping switches up or down on the instrument panel. You know, you hit the front switch, down, the car is going to go down. 
you hit it up, it's gonna go up. Same thing with the rear and, uh, and the two back corners. The more potent the battery power, the higher the hop. This car is outfitted with eight batteries, two pumps, and four switches. It's not too much, it's not too little, uh, so it's just, it's just right. You know, someone comes up, pulls on you, starts hopping, and uh, you don't want to just sit there and let them hop on you, so you answer right back, and that's just enough. Hydraulic setups are also designed to compete for points at car shows, based on visual appeal. Part of an overall display, which includes heavily chromed engines and undercarriages, and pinstriping under the hood. Things that would have been thought out of the norm for a basic lowrider is now a standard and, and creates points. Anti-cruising laws have made it more difficult for lowriders to strut their stuff beyond the bounds of officially sanctioned shows. But the scene still thrives in more informal settings, where social rituals, and even the cars themselves, link generations of families and friends. What's up, man? How you doing? Car guys are family guys. They want to take their children out. They, they want to take their nephews, cousins, and, uh, aunts, grandfathers, and grandmothers. It's a family thing. It's for the love of it. It's in, it's in the blood. And that's the way of life. That's our way of life. Low riders made big and slow the way to go. But a new generation has given custom cars the strangest spin of all. It's a strangely graceful form of pageantry on wheels. A competition in which cars are deliberately oversteered to slide and spin through a series of sharp turns. Instead of racing toward a finish line, contestants are judged on execution and style. It's a bunch of nutters driving on the absolute edge of, of crashing against each other, inches apart. It's, a, it's really a style thing and, you know, how far can you push it? And... Started in Japan, drifting has caught on with a generation of customizers who introduced a new kind of custom car in Southern California in the 1980s, the import tuner. Like the early hot riders, the tuner crowd made their mark by embracing cheap hand-me-downs. In this case, inexpensive Japanese economy cars, like the Honda Civic, and turning them into road warriors. These were cars that Asian-American families bought for their kids to go to school. And of course, you've got a Honda Civic. Well, you don't want it to be looking like everybody else's Honda Civic. So you're going to slam it, you're going to put some rims on it, you're going to put a spoiler on it, you're going to paint it a different color. Next minute, you're going to race it. Until this new breed came along, customizing seemed stuck in time. The 70s gas crisis, coupled with tougher emission standards and later computerized engine control, dissuaded many hot rodders from working on contemporary cars. But a generation raised on the internet could plug software programs into their car's computer ports and change the factory engine specifications, which were often set well below the car's performance capabilities. The uh, engine management programs that are used to control engines could be hacked and the, the parameters changed to give you more performance. And because engine durability had been improved so much in the 20 years between, say, 1970 and 1990, that made the engines uh, more tolerant of being hot-rotted. Import tuners can also be hot-rotted in more traditional ways. Installing a turbocharger, an exhaust-driven pump that forces air into the combustion chamber at higher pressure, helps increase horsepower. 
Another way to add power is to inject nitrous oxide into the air-fuel mixture, which enriches the oxygen content in the cylinders as they're fired. They put turbochargers on them, they put different cylinder heads on them, they put nitrous oxide on them, and suddenly a whole industry grew up around that little car. As the popularity of import tuners grows, Japanese and American manufacturers have stepped up their lines of aftermarket engine parts, which can be ordered and installed under warranty. It's a form of car customizing that's gradually changing the attitude among owners from DIY, do it yourself, to DIFM, do it for me. So now you can pull your car into a garage, have somebody bolt a uh, turbocharger on it, bigger turbocharger, cool, cold air induction, various other things. They can do a lot to the top end of the, uh, of the motor and get more performance. At Pomona, California's SoCal Speed Shop, a late model Chevrolet Cobalt, equipped with a standard Ecotec engine, has been customized so a driver can boost its turbocharger settings at the touch of a button and push it to speeds up to 243 miles per hour. This is a uh, Chevrolet Cobalt, and it's a steel-bodied car, pretty much like the production car you can buy from a dealer. Um, basically, what we've done, working with Roush Industries, is put this uh, seven-point roll cage in there, uh, hands device to protect your head, and it has this wonderful little gadget on the steering wheel where you can increase the boost 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45 pounds of boost. It's just like a video game. Import tuners are going for style points as well. For many, that means neon lights and high-end video and sound systems. They're often on display at multimedia events that feature DJs, dancing, and a wide array of up-to-date models. They're not your father's auto shows. You go to a car show and some of the, some of the stuff they manage to do with them is just mad, really mad. These days, all the events try to encompass car shows, racing, drifting, models, all of it in one. This thing is all about aesthetics, whether it's aesthetics of the car sitting still or whether it's aesthetics of the car in action, smoke in the tire, drag racing. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very, very visual motorsport, more so than maybe anything else, because it's all about you know, ground-shaking power and smoke and smells, and you know, it's what makes it exciting. It, they're doing everything the hot rodders and the customizers did. It's just that they have a different look, you know, but it's still the same game. But even as import tuners define the state of the art, older generations of customizers are giving vintage rides a modern makeover. In 2005, a customized Honda Civic exceeded 195 miles per hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats. Custom Cars will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Custom Cars on Modern Marvels. Once expressions of separate subcultures, hot rods, customs, lowriders, and import tuners have adapted each other's ideas and innovations to become ever more homogenous, an American melting pot on wheels. One of the lessons we can take out of these things is how much creative energy and artistic enterprise there are in just regular people. It's extraordinary when you look back and, and look at some of these cars and say, these guys were, you know, they were factory workers and, uh, and machinists and uh, clerks and uh, in a way, it kind of reminds us of the innate genius in all of us. And uh, who knows where it will go next. This is the GTO Roadster. Retro back from the 60s. How would you like to drive a Roadster GTO in 2005 and 6? This will give you an idea of what we do here in California. For legendary customizer George Barris, the future of custom cars inevitably draws from its past. His restyled Pontiac GTO combines the old-fashioned power of a muscle car with the modern accoutrements of an import tuner, such as vertically hinged doors, pairs of 20 and 22-inch wheels, and cameras installed inside the taillights, which project views through video monitors mounted on the dash. I took the side mirrors and I threw them away. 
and all I do is look at my dash now. I got two monitors. I can see 45 degrees anywhere around me. You'll find that John Q. Public, whether he's a car guy or not, is going to definitely look at this GTO and enjoy it. Outfitting customs has become big business. The garage where Vic Edelbrock Sr. began designing manifolds has evolved into a sprawling manufacturing plant. My father used to get an idea and the pattern maker would kind of draw it out on a piece of wood and he'd say, I want so much area under the carburetor and then I want so much taper and that. Today, uh, we do it much, much better because we've got the equipment to do it with. These days, Edelbrock makes more types of aftermarket parts than any other company. Its signature products, manifolds and cylinder heads, are still crafted entirely in-house. From computerized designs, to casting and machining, to packaging for final sale. And when we're through, it's strictly take out of the box and put it on the engine. This is the key to the program. The demand for old school hot rods and customs is surging as well. Now it's possible to either build a car mail order or to go to a shop like ours and have a car either part built or completely built. So it's real easy to have something that looks old but that works in a modern way. Brian Brennan has done just that. His street rod, a 1932 Model A body perched on a 29 frame, melds classic style with contemporary performance. The grill shell is, is a 1932 Ford uh, with a 32 Ford inset. Uh, the hood is a three-piece hood, and it's aluminum, and, and in effect, it's a custom hood. Uh, the windshield frame is reminiscent of a Model A, but here again, it's not Model A. It's also a custom piece. Um, the, the front suspension, what's holding in place? Well, those are hairpins uh, that are from uh, SoCal here in Pomona, California. And the wheels are reminiscent of early race car wheels. Uh, the interior, very traditional in its style. Very plain, very simple. It's, uh, it's a simple uh, pleat, and it's done in black leather. Uh, it's a roadster, all right? And in my case, I've chosen not to have a top. Uh, some people think I'm crazy to want to drive all the time without a top. I like to think that uh, I get to see things they don't get to see. In this overwhelmingly male-driven automotive culture, custom cars may be the ultimate boys' toys, both the symbol and the object of an age-old romantic quest. On one side, you can see that part of customizing your car hopefully will translate into you attracting a beautiful woman. And the other side is that the car does take on these elements of a woman. Are cars male or female? It depends on the owner, and it also depends on the emotional state of the owner. The one thing about automobiles is that, you know, they rarely say no. 